Hello and welcome to the third section of our motivational complex. So this third section will be about the evolution or the history of answer set programming and the underlying stable model semantics. In fact, I decided to give you only a brief history simply because it's not worthwhile that I talk, insert, talk about technical concepts and insert them in, in the time flow when you have not yet seen them, right? So this will be even more hand-waving than it already is. Okay, so what I will do rather is give you now a short introduction to things and hope to produce in a month or two a longer version where I then actually can refer to the things that you have seen in between. Okay, let's get started. Of course, I'm providing you here with my very personal view of things. And this started more or less in the 80s, where I think also the formalization of the phenomena as such started where most of the papers were produced that more or less tried to capture the underlying problem of dealing with incomplete information. On the other hand, I guess looking at this phenomena traces back to the 50s, even at the very first uh, AI workshop in Dartmouth that John McCarthy, the founder of the field, put together and gathering people from engineering, philosophy, mathematics, all who worked on AI or topics that later on became AI during the war. Uh, already looked at this phenomenon because it's more or less one of the, I'd say, distinguishing features of common sense reasoning, of, you, of how you, you and I actually are reasoning. And I think they were at the time inspired by planning. Where they had, imagine, imagine you have a, describe the situation. You describe more or less uh, the, the situation where you listen to this talk or I describe my desk here. And then you execute an action. So more or less you, I don't know, you, you, you take an object and put it somewhere else. And then the question is, how does the next state look like? The state after the execution of the action. Well, you may know the effect of the action. So this must be true if everything went well. But what about all the rest? Has it stayed the same? Has it been changed? And of course, you assume, and this is a very um, economic way, you assume that everything stayed the same, even though you don't know. You don't have information about it. You only know that more or less the action has been executed, its effects took hopefully place, but even that may be in question. So you have to deal with incomplete information. You never know actually what is happening in the real world, in particular if you think like being a little robot in a black box, right? Okay, so in the 80s, um, people started to formalize uh, what has actually been implemented in the decades before. And if we look a little bit at the ancestors of ASP, the, and in particular it's, uh, it's ancestors that deal with closed world reasoning, there's database systems, logic programming, non-monotonic reasoning. So in databases, of course, you know, uh, information that is in a database is regarded to be true. Information that is unknown, because it's not listed explicitly in the database, is regarded to be false. This is a very effective means of, uh, of compact representation. Logic programming, it has had this negation as failure operator that said, well, um, something is, can be assumed to be true unless it was proven. So there's this not operator. If you say not A, it means not A is true unless A is proven. Right? So this means actually that it can be false, but also when it's unknown, not A may be true. Anyway, so you see already this goes in this direction how to deal of how to deal with incomplete information mechanism for this. And in non-monotonic reasoning, this was more or less the, 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 the area where the most fine-grained approaches were looked at, where auto-epistemic reasoning was about introspection of an agent. So, for instance, if I had an elder brother, I would know about it. Since I don't know about it, I don't have an older brother. You see a little bit how this goes, right? d logics, there you can simply describe rules. That, um, that specify defaults, and this is actually very close to, to also what we do in, in, in answer set programming, and circumscription, where the idea is you minimize abnormalities. You look at models that are the most normal. Anyway, what you see here is a whole zoo of different approaches, and actually if you look at the literature, you may easily find, I don't know, perhaps 50 approaches dealing with different forms of dealing with incomplete information, and actually in both logic programming and non monotonic reasoning. Because people had to capture this phenomenon. It was something that was not inve investigated before. And as I said, philosophers also looked at it and perhaps still do, right? So this was more or less the age where, as I said, these were more or less the three mothers 
of three of the four mothers of ASP that we saw on, 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 on the last, uh, in the last section, where they got together, where they met. And so if you, if you think that this, oh, I'm not, well, if, if, you, if you follow my analogy that this is where the parents or the mothers met, then actually the 90s uh, are the ages where ASP was born. And this, I, I titled this here Amalgamation and Computation. Amalgamation means this zoo of different approaches more or less converged to dominating approaches. And this was more or less the stable model semantics that then led to answer set programming. And what actually converged was the well-found and the stable model semantics. And we will talk a lot about this. Stable model semantics, of course, is the semantics that describes the models of answer set programming. And the well-founded semantics is an underlying uh, semantics from which we can actually derive a stable model semantics. So as you see this here, in this age, actually, there was a paper written by a V.S. Subramanian at the time who simply says, well, if you want to compute stable models, you compute the well-founded semantics and there actually some things are still undefined and then you do case analysis and you branch. And then you do the well-founded semantics again. If you still have undefined atoms, you branch and this is more or less how you can compute stable models. But the most important thing is what happened here in the 80s, this wild exploration of different alternatives more or less converged in the 90s and uh, converged actually in stable model semantics and well-founded semantics. Then, well, again, if, if the 90s is, is the decade where stable model semantics and so answer set programming was born, the, the first decade of the new millennium was dominated by uh, systems and uh, semantic rediscoveries, I just read this now, which actually is more or less a teenage age, right? Things go still a bit wild. So we have seen actually uh, the, 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 the uh, number of uh, applications in the, in the last section, so I won't repeat them here, but what was the most astonishing, in particular in retrospective now, is that David Pierce discovered that the semantics of, of the stable model semantics can be traced back to a logic that was investigated by Heiting and Gödel independently at the beginning of the 90s, the logic of here and there, and he defined then equilibrium logic from this, which is exactly the logic we are dealing with. But you have to keep in mind that it was really in the, in the beginning of, 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 of the millennium where this really where people got aware of this, where suddenly there were logical foundations. Because before, and we will see this in the next in, in well, the next um, parts where we have to characterize the semantics, there are very different ways, and you may ask yourself, why this way? Well, this, this is mainly historic reasons. In logic programming, one used fixed point operators. In um, non-monotonic reasoning, one used, well, different types, right? And, but at the end of the day, there was a logic lying around which people, where people didn't make the connection. And you know, this is, of course, very different from for instance, the neighboring field in propositional logic, classical propositional logic and satisfiability testing. The foundations of this were, were laid by George Boole in the 17th century, if I'm not mistaken, right? And we had hundreds of years to study this. And of course, this is the dominating logic. This is more or less when you do a proof nowadays. In, in, this is the logic in which you do the proof. But here in this field, it took, well, it took a couple of decades of research, of course, but the, the, the foundations were not there at the beginning. They were rediscovered. Other alternative foundations had to be found, which came from different angles, not from a logical angle. Okay, so if these were the teenage age, then actually the, in the second millennium, in the, from 2010 to, I don't know, nowadays perhaps, this is about adulthood. We are settling down, right? So ASP is now more and more applied in industry, in academia. It has... There are different reasoning modes. You can do optimization. You can intersect the models. Or you can do there multi-shot solving, as as we will see later on. There are APIs, application programming interfaces, that you can take the ASP system and embed it into another, a larger software environment. Hybridization. You can combine nowadays ASP with uh, constraint satisfaction or with with other theory solving methods. You see, things are getting more and more mature and having a development that many many other fields. So, this was more or less my quick rundown of, of, of the history. Um, I will actually refine this later on, as, as mentioned before, but right now I think this should serve a little bit as an outlook. However, one thing that is not so much captured here, and this is a development that was not done in answer set programming, 
uh, is also very important to note, and I will show this to you next. And this has to do with a paradigm shift in the 90s. To understand this, one has to see that up to then, a big part of AI was based on theorem-proving based methods, like planning, there was deductive planning, and uh, the declarative programming approach in, in logic was, uh, was dominated by Prolo. A programming language, a declarative programming language, language, where the idea was also that you provide a representation of the problem, which is more or less declarative, but then actually a solution is given by a derivation of a query. And this is like in theorem proving where the idea is you want to prove a theorem from a set of premises and the premises are the problem. And there were many, many other approaches. I just take this as, a, as an exemplar because it relates closely to, to, a, to ASP. Anyway, so query orientation, top-down computation, finding a proof for a query. Now this was replaced mid of the 90s by a model generation based approach. And here I think one has to name uh, satisfiability testing as the sub area that pushed this forward, where the idea is also to provide a representation of the problem, but now actually a solution is given by a model of the representation. And again, think of the representation as a, as a I don't know, a logical formula, uh, a program. You have propositions and these propositions can be true or false. And an assignment to all the propositions with true and false that makes the whole representation, the whole formula true, this is a model. So this is now a very different approach than before. And, and somehow this is an approach that aligns better with actually constraint satisfaction problems, which were also around at the time, but weren't somehow, I'd say, so dominating. So how did this discovery happen? In fact, at the time, there were Henry Kautz and Bart Selman working at AT&T Bell Labs in the US who investigated satisfiability testing algorithms, stochastic ones. I think Bart worked on GSAT at the time with David Mitchell and so on and so forth. Anyway, they were looking at this and they looked for benchmarks. How can I actually evaluate and have benchmarks that allow, me, that allow us to scale and anyway, evaluate the algorithms. And this is now my guessing of the part because Bart actually studied at the University of Toronto and there was Stephen Cook and Stephen Cook is more or less the guy who, who identified um, NP problems. And I think in his proof, he, he showed that you can encode a Turing machine in, in propositional logic. And more or less a Turing machine, you have a state, you have an action, you get the next state, and so on and so forth. Encoding this is very similar to encoding planning problems. And that's what they tried. And they represented planning problems as propositional theories so that the models of the theories and not proofs anymore describe solutions. And the big surprise at the time was, and by chance I happened to be at this ECAI conference, the European Conference of AI in, in Vienna, uh, the big surprise was that this was competitive with off-the-shelf dedicated planning systems. And this was a big shock and, and the shockwaves actually went through whole AI and in particular knowledge representation and reasoning for a long time. That so something that people had put aside, right? Generating models um, was now actually emerging as something viable and actually pretty efficient. And actually ASP more or less has the same nature in the sense that you have a problem representation and the solutions of the problem are given by the stable models of the problem. Hence, this is a very, very important discovery that we draw upon as well. And of course, uh, satisfiability testing is the fourth mother of ASP, and this is actually what we owe a lot to this community. Okay, then in the next uh, section, we'll look a little bit at the foundations of ASP. Stay tuned. Bye.